common critique that many advocates of community and RBEs face is that such ideas are utopian and cannot materialise in our current reality. It's perhaps the most prolific argument that's put forward against the systems and structures proponents advocate for, and so is in dire need of being thoroughly addressed, and that is what I aim to do in this instalment. Depending on who you ask, the definition of utopia has many different interpretations. If you asked an average member of the general public what they thought a utopia is, their likely response is to see it as meaning a perfect world, or imagining a world substantially better than the one we currently live in. Among intelligentsia, however, the word utopia is seen in a more negative light, which can be understandable, as the word quite literally translates from Greek to the phrase no place. To many critics of new ideas, if these ideas don't seem immediately realistic to them, they will often label it as utopian. RBEs and community are no exception to this. The argument that these proposed ideas are utopian actually comes from the mouths of a variety of different perspectives, all across the social and political spectrums, including those perspectives which proponents are often conflated with. Although it might seem like community slash RBE proponents and Marxists would have a lot in common, many Marxists are quick to dismiss such ideas as utopian, or as they like to call it, idealist. The argument often goes, for example, that there is no material basis for resource-based economies, often because A, RBE proponents are often pacifist, while Marxists are revolutionary, B, because they think that the theory of RBEs is underdeveloped and that proponents haven't really thought the whole thing through, C, because they don't think the technological means to create such an economy exists yet, or D, because they think that changing to a different system requires political action, and that because proponents have little political power, they also have little means of achieving their goals. With regards to point A, it's important to consider that there are many ways of bringing about substantial change without necessarily revolutionary action. To address point A and B simultaneously, I will introduce the concept of transition. As opposed to revolution, community and RBE proponents advocate a transition into this new type of society. We see the development of human societies as a trajectory of social evolution. Just as Rome wasn't built in a day, capitalism didn't replace feudalism overnight. No, this was a socially evolutionary process that spanned hundreds of years. Paleolithic society lasted for hundreds of thousands of years. Neolithic and slave societies lasted tens of thousands of years after that. And feudalism, comparatively, lasted only a few thousand years, and capitalism has only been around a few hundred. From this, we can infer that much like Moore's Law, social evolution is accelerating, with each transition to a different kind of society taking a shorter and shorter amount of time. The case for community and RBEs in modern times is becoming more and more explicit. Environmentalism and ecology are things that are central to the ideas being put forward by proponents. Thus, environmental issues such as climate change are of great concern to us. In our advocacy, we can make the case that the systems we propose are necessary for not just saving, but also enriching ecology and the natural world. And this case helps create a strong material basis for transition. Bringing point C into the mix, it's becoming ever more clear that the technical conditions for a transition into a resource-based economy already exist today. With new advanced methods of extracting and cultivating resources, we have the capability to create a sustainable abundance in a variety of areas, and some sectors such as renewable energy are rapidly approaching zero marginal cost. At the same time, work is being automated on a much greater scale than ever before. This creates a contradiction that our current system simply cannot deal with effectively, because a system based on scarcity and labour cannot function in a world of abundance and automated work, whereas RBEs can indeed do this, because we would aim to save labour and resources as much as possible, while also granting people the fruits of automation and other technical advancement. And within contemporary society, this advancement creates yet another case for a transition. 
Finally addressing D, I want to make a couple of points here. Firstly, it's mostly untrue that the existence of radically different societies necessitates large political institutions. Autonomous intentional communities vary in scale, and each has their own unique way of doing things that doesn't necessarily align with the political or societal status quo. As proponents of community and RBEs, we could take advantage of this type of communitarian organisation, eventually gaining the means to expand outward. I will discuss this in more detail in a later video. Anyway, the second point I would like to make in response to this critique is that not everything is political and that politics is more often not a good vehicle for human progress. Compared to the scientific method, religion, business, and political institutions have done relatively little in propelling humanity forward. Science and observational study have been some of the greatest influences of technological advancement. If we applied scientific and intuitive design to our social systems with a solutions-based approach to problem solving rather than a political one, we could accelerate human progress at an unprecedented rate. I'm not talking about some kind of overlord AI nor a governmental board of technocrats here. What I'm instead talking about is applying to society and economics what works best and working to improve such through a communal effort using scientific means. Resource management systems, for example, will not be controlled by a central authority. Rather, their improvement and maintenance will be managed collectively as a collaborative effort within and between communities. Many social movements in the past have either collapsed internally or have been suppressed and crushed by external powers. During a transition into an RBE community-based society, how would we handle diplomacy and prevent this? One disagreement I have with leftists is their readiness to endorse social movements in developing countries. Strategically, this plays into the hands of superpowers, because it's very easy for them to invade a developing country and stop the movement in its tracks. In my view, the best course of action strategically would be to start the transition in developed countries that are not superpowers. America, Russia and China are unlikely to go to war with many European countries, for example, because not only would important trade ties be broken, it would also be geopolitical suicide. Therefore, starting a transition in a non-superpower first world country effectively insulates this process from superpower influence. We'd still have local authorities to deal with, but that's a much smaller issue. These transitional communities would be difficult for superpowers to invade because they'd be invading an ally in the process. They'd be impossible to sanction because RBEs by definition don't use money. And embargoes would be ineffective once these communities become self-sustaining using a variety of technologies. And this goes without mentioning the sheer power of a decentralized transition. If you have all of these transitional communities popping up everywhere, then it's impossible to track down every single one of them. If the effort and resources are used to take down one transitional community, three more take its place in an entirely different location. Once it hits critical mass, a decentralized transition into a resource-based economy and into community would be almost unstoppable, all without the use of violence or force. As a form of diplomacy, we could still use money as a way of trading resources with the outside world. Not only would this mean more resources to add to our pool, but would also mean better relations with our host countries. As opposed to being secret about all of our operations, we could conduct information campaigns as a way of countering propaganda against our cause. If the general public knows more about the benefits of community and resource-based economies, then they are less likely to believe smears and hit pieces pushed out by mass media, for example. I may do a more in-depth discussion about diplomacy in a future instalment. When explaining how ideas like community and resource-based economies are utopian or that they simply wouldn't work, Opponents often look to human nature as an example of why. This not only ignores countless amounts of anthropological and historical study, but also basic reality. As we can infer from many indigenous peoples around the world, such as the Amazonians, primitive human societies were egalitarian in structure and utilized forms of gift rather than exchange. While proponents don't advocate reverting back to a primitive lifestyle, we do often look to these societies as a form of inspiration for our ideas. Contrary to a biological determination of behavior of which many opponents would assert, human behavior is instead shaped by the environment, whether that be a physical environment 
a social environment, an economic environment, or otherwise. In a previous video, I used the example of feral children to show how behaviour is not innate, but is nurtured. However, now, I'm going to give a much more trivial example. Can you guess? Language. I am speaking to you in English. I have a British accent. But not because I am myself biologically British, but simply because I was born and raised in Britain. If I was raised in Canada, I would have a Canadian accent. If I was raised in China or Japan, I would be speaking primarily Chinese or Japanese. If someone from Eritrea was to be raised in Sweden, they would speak native Swedish and would likely have a Swedish accent and when introduced to their mother tongue, would likely be unable to understand a word of it. Accompanying these facts, wouldn't it then be logical to assume that people raised in an egalitarian environment of cooperation and abundance would behave significantly different to how people behave in our current system? Studies of chimp and bonobo societies do show that scarcity and abundance does indeed have an impact on culture and social structure. Inferring from the cases of these primates, environments of scarcity tend to beget competition and hierarchy, whereas environments of abundance promote cooperation, peace, and more horizontal forms of organisation. In humans, we can see environments of abundance probably having a similar effect. It's often posited that economies of relative abundance rather than scarcity are impossible to achieve because human wants are somehow infinite. The reality, however, is that the very notion of infinite wants is itself impossible. It's impossible because of basic physics and biology. For example, a single person can never have an infinite want for food, because as you get fuller and fuller, eating becomes much less of a pleasurable experience, and eating too much food in one sitting tends to make people very sick. Moreover, you cannot be in more than one place at a single time. Therefore, it makes no sense to say that every single person on the planet has an infinite demand for housing, physics, biology, nature, ecology is all geared towards efficiency. Human wants are finite, and in many cases because of the efficiency of the world we live in, abundance relative to realistic demand for resources is often a fact of nature. And an example of this is how human wants are finite because they are, in many ways, self-limiting. Another perspective from which community and RBEs are deemed as utopian is that if they do indeed work on a small scale, they can't possibly work with large populations in complex societies. I consider this argument null because it is ignorant of the kind of social structures proponents like myself want to implement. Yes, it's true, there are only so many people you can intimately know in your lifetime, as illustrated by Dunbar's number. And on top of that, there's only so many people you will actually meet in your lifetime, whether you retain relations with them or not. Now previously, I've seen this argument be used against gift economics as an alternative to markets. The argument goes that because people outside of one's immediate environment are much less likely to know that person as well as people within it, socioeconomic relations with less known people are more likely to break down and potentially cause conflict. However, because of advancing technology, namely the internet, what we consider our immediate social environment is rapidly expanding. And so with a rapidly expanding social environment, through things like social media and many other means, people would be able to closer connect with even more people. And the same would be the case between groups of people and organisations. In fact, because of the social nature of the modern internet, it makes for an ideal infrastructure for a gift economy. A second point I'd like to make on this criticism is about resource management systems. It's often stated that non-market systems of economic calculation are impossible for large populations. While this may be true to some extent in the case of centralised systems, if resource management systems were decentralised, we would be able to break the task of economic calculation into small manageable bits, accounting for each individual community and beyond that, each sector of a community's economy. These would all have their own independent but intercommunicating resource management systems that focus on a few devolved tasks each and share data about resources and economic activity with other nodes of the system. By managing resources and economic activity in a decentralised fashion and at a community and inter-community level, 
we can scale these systems up modularly in order to make these forms of economic calculation work for large numbers of people. This would not require some advanced ultra-intelligent AI, but instead a few individual algorithms completing each low-level task. And that's what makes it feasible. These algorithms would likely be open source and so could be improved upon over time by individuals, groups, and communities. And this prevents a single entity gaining power over a resource management system. Economies of scale are no barrier to RBEs or community, as I have just explained. The reality is that although it may seem such, the ideas I and other proponents are advocating for are not utopian nor idealist, but instead are desirable, pragmatic and appropriate given the material conditions of today. We need a society, a culture, of freedom and interdependence. We need an economy that enriches our lives, yet is also harmonious with the existence and flourishing of all life and ecology. These are not ideas to mock as utopian, but are instead a vision of a world to strive for. Currently, we do not have this world. Our world, our current paradigm, is crippling, volatile and unsustainable. It makes no sense for the ideas put forward to be called utopian, but to think a system of politics, poverty, war, growth and destruction is indeed sustainable, is pure delusion. So there you have it, I hope I've addressed everything. Hopefully community and RBEs won't be seen as so utopian in the future, at least I hope so. Anyway, I hope you've enjoyed the video. Links to any needed citations will be in the description. It's also worth mentioning that I now have a blog where I will post a variety of related things. It's still in its early stages, but it's being built up piece by piece. So if you like, you can go check it out and see what you think. Next time I might try something a bit different, add a little variety to spice things up a bit. Anyway, that's all from me. I've been Adam, thank you all for watching, and I'll catch you in the next one.